For our project this week, I would like you to try making a tea bowl. A tea bowl is a traditional Japanese form that the idea is that it's an open bowl with fairly vertical sides. And if you drink matcha tea, you can get in there with one of those bamboo whisks and whisk that delicious matcha up into a nice froth. Um, they're also kind of um, important culturally in Japan. So some of the most valuable works of art from Japan are tea bowls. Um, we think of the finest of fine arts as being oil paintings and some of the most valuable pieces of art in Japan are actually ceramic tea bowls. So um, I think that potters everywhere kind of gravitate towards the idea of these as being really expressive and um, creative. So I don't pretend to be an expert on all the intricacies of a Japanese tea bowl, but I like the form and I want to show you some things that you can apply um, that relate to the aesthetics of um, some Japanese tea bowls. So we're going to talk about wheel speed, hand speed ratio. Um, in other words, slowing down the wheel and making some moves that are a little bit more dynamic and um, I wouldn't say fast, but definitely not uh, so tight and controlled that everything looks perfectly uniform. We're going to create a little bit of movement and um, a little wabi-sabi in the forms. So I'm going to reposition the camera and show you my take on the T-Bowl. I've got a little over a pound of clay here, uh, which will be a small one. Um, I actually don't like the really big ones. I don't really want to drink that much matcha at a sitting anyway. Um, and I like them to still kind of fit in one hand if I want. So they will be a trimmed form. I'll have to let it get leather hard and show you how I trim the foot. Um, but let me show you how I throw them and use that as an example of um, how wheel speed to hand speed ratios can affect the overall look of the piece. So we'll start out just centering. The good news is if you've been struggling with centering, a lot of times um, master tea bowl makers intentionally don't get the clay all the way centered. I always do. I want to kind of control the amount of I don't know, movement in the form. So I'm gonna open, but I'm not gonna open down to a quarter inch, I'm gonna leave about a half an inch in the bottom uh, to allow for trimming a foot. Put a little bit back, I'm not sure I left quite enough. And then I'm gonna draw outward pretty much like a bowl, curved bottom. So if I was going in there with a whisk, I want to be able to um, not run into some kind of a corner. And then I'm going to pull this thing mostly like a cylinder. So I'm going to draw in a little bit instead of letting it come out towards my right shoulder like I would for a um, for a regular bowl. I'm going to form kind of a drinking lip there. Um, so that was the first pull. The second pull, you can probably hear the wheel kind of whining. It's going really fast. For the second pull, I'm going to slow it way down to get it nice and wet. And I'm going to do the second pull. Um, it's still going to start from stillness and finish at stillness, but it's going to move from the bottom to top in about three or four revolutions of the wheel. So it's, it's not frantic, but it's certainly um, purposeful, uh, the move, movement from bottom to top. I'm going to grab all of that clay and come on up. And then pause and release. So you can see the evidence of that ratio of wheel to hand speed in the swirls. So if you think of it as kind of a barber pole type situation, um, those spirals are coming up and there are approximately three or four from the bottom to the top. Now, this is a bowl that you pick up and drink from. So it's nice if the edge has a, has a pretty sweet drinking lip on it. So I'm going to support the edge of the bowl with my thumb and forefinger, and I'm going to dive my index finger down into the interior while keeping the knuckle of my middle finger against the outside. And the idea here is that I'm going to taper the wall in and down so that when I drink from it, it kind of pours out into my mouth. I started that move earlier in the form. Um, 
after the first pull and I just completed it there. Now, I am going to expand this form now that I've done the pulling because I feel like the stretching really adds a lot to the character of the form and it also opens it up a little bit. But we want to maintain the idea of a more vertical side. This isn't a bowl that opens out like a rice bowl. Um, it's definitely a, a low wide cup. So I've got my rib here, um, my trusty yellow Cheryl mud tool rib. Um, you can also use a type of rib called a Hera, H-E-R-A, um, that are, I guess they're called like cow's tongue ribs. They've got a curve to them. And these are quite cool because they'll work in the bottom and also work on the side. But I'm just gonna go with my, my tried and true yellow rib here. And I'm gonna have, again, the wheel going fairly slowly. And I'm just gonna start a little bit to the right of center and I'm gonna find the center of the, of the form. And then I'm gonna stretch out kind of quickly and then move slowly up the wall and then slowly release it. So you can see how that really transformed it from more of a straight cup to a much more expansive open form. I'm kind of liking the contrast that the dirty red clay water in my bucket is producing against the um, the white of the Phoenix clay. So I'm going to just leave that. I'm not going to completely rib everything clean. I'm going to just run the wood knife into the base. I call this the snow plow version of using the wood knife. It just pulls a little bit of clay off and creates a little start for the wire tool. And I'm noticing that I don't love the uh, what happened to the lip. When I went in with the rib, it kind of destroyed that drinking lip that I produced. So I'm gonna just take one little opportunity to um, adjust that with the chamois. And that would also give me an opportunity to talk to you about using the chamois. I'm currently reaching down for my cleaner bucket of water to wet this up. So a lot of misconceptions about chamois use. Um, it's not just this thing that you hold between your hands and flop over the rim and kind of pull down on to smooth the rim. It's actually just sort of webbing for your hands that allows you to really control the shape of the lip. So I'm gonna show you the hand position that I use. This is kind of a wide piece of chamois, but I can still show you what's happening. So my thumbs go underneath it and my middle fingers go on top and my index fingers are left free because I want them to be able to manipulate the rim. And what I wanna do is produce a little loop and I'm gonna show you with the camera a little loop of chamois between my two middle fingers. And it's not a big one because I don't want my middle fingers halfway down the pot. I want them right up there by the rim. So I'm forming that little loop and I'm gonna drape it right over the rim of the pot. And then I can use my index finger to help shape the lip in the direction I want it to go. So I wanted to kind of reestablish my drinking lip. So I cross my index finger over from the outside to the inside so that this side of my uh, index finger would create the diagonal that I was looking for. So the big thing is just, it's the middle fingers on the outside, thumbs support underneath, and then your index fingers are free to shape. And you're not pressing with the chamois downward, you're squeezing inward and then compressing the lip. So it's very much like consolidating the rim with two hands. It's just that we're doing it with our fingers on either side and the chamois as kind of webbing in between. So if you're not familiar with the chamois or you're afraid of the chamois because of bad results in the past, um, give it a shot and see what you get from it. Um, one thing I love about the aesthetics of tea bowls is that they're very um, free and loose. So this one's actually fairly tight for me, but um, I just wanted to show you kind of the basics. I never worry about picking them up. I uh, would never throw one on a bat, for example. So I'm gonna use this bat to pick it up, but I actually intentionally pick these things up uh, with just four fingers so that they distort a little bit. So I can grab that and show you. That's the kind of swirly side. And this has got a fairly level rim. This wouldn't, this wouldn't pass muster in Japan, but um, it'll certainly serve some green tea. And I'm gonna leave that little swirl of red clay goo and whatever distortions have come from me holding this up to the camera. 
and then we'll trim it tomorrow when it gets to be leather hard. So here's the T-bowl that we made and it has sat overnight unwrapped in my very humid garage studio. So it has now arrived at the soft leather hard stage. Uh, the rim's feeling fairly stiff and leather hard. The bottom still feels like it's got a, a little bit of give to it, which is perfect. That's how I like to trim these T-bowls. I like them to be soft enough that um, I don't have any trouble at all cutting through the clay. So it already has the beginnings of this lower angle underneath. Um, we're gonna accentuate that as we create the foot. The thing to remember is if you're holding hot liquid in a pot with no handle, you need somewhere to kind of get your fingers out of the heat. And so the, the typical thing is to hold by the rim and the foot of the pot. So we wanna establish a really nice distinctive foot um, so that it'll function both as a handle and also as a, a beautiful addition to the overall form. So enough on that. I've got some clay to hold down my piece and let's go ahead and trim this thing. I'm going to put it on the wheel upside down and I want to establish something that's roughly centered. The more wabi-sabi and, and irregular your T-bowl is, the more you have to kind of just average out the differences. So that's not running perfectly true everywhere, but on average, that looks about centered. So now I'm going to subdivide my hold down clay into four pieces. I'm going to roll them into little coils and it's very important to curve them around and stick them down on opposite sides simultaneously so that you don't lose the center. So roll it, roll it, curve it around and then don't push in against your pot, push down and seal your little uh, securing coils to the wheel. Now this is stable and it shouldn't go anywhere. I do all of my trimming with one tool. Um, I also have some Dolan trim tools that are really nice. Uh, this is kind of a Dolan knockoff. You can see I've used it for a long time. There's almost no metal left in it. I've sharpened it so many times. Um, but these are very versatile because they've got a narrow point up here that I can use for fine starting and establishing the foot. And then it's got a very uh, shallow curve through here to do what the, the broader tool from like the toolkit would do. So I'm gonna start out by taking any little bit of dried clay off of this edge. The better thing is to put them away clean and then you don't ever have that problem, but I don't ever seem to get that done. Um, sometimes the easiest thing is just to take a needle tool and run it around the inside of the loop. Just any dry clay that's on there is gonna produce drag and drag is not your friend. So. The sequence of operations that I like is establishing the diameter of my foot first, the outside diameter of the foot. And the way I do that is I bring the tip of the tool downward like so. And I hold it at about a 45 degree angle because that's about where the bevel is on the tool. And I lock it in my hand. It's really held firm. My finger is against the metal of the loop. This is not going to come loose in my hand. Then I lock my arms down, lock my second hand onto the loop itself. I put a finger on top of the pot. So you get the idea here. We are in control of exactly where this tool is gonna move. And I'm gonna cut straight down and take a little ring of clay off. This bottom part is much, much softer. So this clay is, you know, you can mush it back up and probably throw it again. <clears throat> so, um, because of that, I need to stop and clear the tool more frequently than I did there. Um, I'll take a cut and, and then I just lift off and peel off what I just cut. It takes a little getting used to, to trim clay that's wet enough that you could wedge it up and put it back on the wheel. But there are some advantages. Um, there is very little resistance to the tool. Uh, so you don't have to worry about it being super sharp um, and you don't have to worry about it kind of pushing you around. You're in control, but you're also, um, you know, potentially you can go places you don't want to go if you're um, not careful. 
and it'll also all get stuck back down if you don't clear it off. So to me, that's an appropriate foot diameter on the outside. It uh, relates nicely to the form. It gives me a chance to create a nice, strong outward flow at the base of my pot. I don't want to leave this ridge here. That was just from the end of the tool coming. So this is where the versatility of this tool comes in. I can now turn it so that I've got the point toward the foot and I'm going to cut from the outside in. And apparently I'm going to cut right through the side of my T-bowl. So that's not exactly what I had in mind for this demo. Um, I'm going to pretend like it didn't happen and just show you um, how I would finish up. I just got heavy handed and I wanted a nice um, single cut to get it done. And I guess I just didn't account for the wall thickness properly. Uh, it's a teaching moment. I can show you um, before you start trimming, I should have probed kind of where my wall thickness was. Um, I obviously didn't have as much down there as I thought. So let me see if I can show you. It's probably going to collapse. In fact, as I was going to show you how I was going to empty out the inside. Basically, I would cut down inside the foot. Yeah, that's not going to do it because it's falling in because the entire side of it has um, collapsed. But um, I would have cut down inside the foot almost as deeply as I did on the outside. And then I would take one kind of smooth cut from the outside towards the center and lift off. So I get kind of a nice swirl and finish shape there in the bottom. So I think that that is not exactly how I intended to demonstrate these T-bowls, but um, I think I'm going to show it to you anyway, um, because, you know, they don't always go right. Um, had it worked, it would have had kind of a nice proportion like this. You would have been able to hold onto the foot and the rim um, as it is. I've got my, my pile of learning uh, ready to go back <laughs> into a, a new piece of clay and maybe have life again as a T-bowl.